Great. Thank you so much, Leanna. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I want to extend my gratitude to the Center for Texas Studies for the invitation. Um, also, thank you to Linda Barrett here at the Fort Worth Public Library. Uh, thanks to all of you who are joining us today here and to those of us who are joining virtually. Uh, my talk today is about my book, Smeltertown, Making and Remembering a Southwest Border Community, um, and about the research that went into, um, into that book and the process of research and discovery. Now, Smeltertown was a, an academic history book. It was a book that I wrote that came out of my PhD dissertation um, and uh, one that I have used in classes and has been used in classes to teach about the history of El Paso, the history of Texas. Um, but it was also a journey through family archives, through um, uh, our family histories and, and our memories. Um, in our time here today, I want to talk about how those paths converged and speak to you about how my research um, opened up a new way of thinking about history and its place in our families and in our communities. Um, in particular, I want to focus on how my research led me to know a little bit more about the life of my grandmother, Luz Luján Perales, about whom I only had the vaguest of childhood memories. Now, I didn't intend to write a family history, um, but I did learn a lot more about how our families are the keepers of history and how the methods of historians can help us uh, develop and tell fuller and more inclusive stories about the past. So allow me to share my screen here and uh, some images with you. All right. Um, before I get into the story about my grandmother, um, allow me to orient you all in time and space. You know, up here in Fort Worth, we're pretty far from El Paso, um, so I think it, it's, it's useful and helpful to kind of give us a sense of where we're, we're talking about. Um, and so in my book, I trace the formation, evolution, demise, and collective memory of Smeltertown, one of the largest single industry company towns on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, it was built in, in El Paso, Texas. Smeltertown formed at the base of the now extinct American Smelting and Refining Company, also known as ASARCO, uh, and that was in the 1880s. Uh, and for almost a century, it was home to thousands of Mexican ASARCO workers and their families. Over time, the boundaries of Smeltertown uh, expanded beyond the company town that was uh, created on uh, company-owned property on the bluff overlooking the Rio Grande. And by the 1930s and 1940s, the nearly self-contained community was the site of several smaller neighborhoods, um, a number of industries, so not only was there the copper smelter, but a large brick-making plant as well as a cement plant and a quarry that uh, supplied the materials for the cement-making plant. Um, there was a significant Mexican-owned commercial district, which I'll show you, um, as well as a population of several thousand. Um, so I wanted to start with a few images. Um, this here is an image taken from, uh, it's a modern uh, Google Maps photo. Uh, for any of you who have been to El Paso before, um, you know that El Paso is a city that is built in between a couple of, of mountain ranges. Um, and in particular, um, I'll highlight here in the room with this, uh, this little doodad right here. Um, you can, I, I want to point out that it's really the meeting place of multiple states. So you have the New Mexico-Texas uh, state line right here. You can see the U.S.-Mexico border is along here. Um, El Paso in the center uh, with its sister city of Ciudad Juarez located right outside, uh, right down south here. So it's, it, the, the two cities are, are right up against one another. Uh, for the folks on Zoom, I'll use this uh, cursor, which also shows El Paso right here, the international boundary, the state uh, boundary up here at the top uh, across from the, um, the sister city. Uh, let me also give you a little bit of a zoom in. Again, this is still a modern photograph taken from Google Maps. Um, and you can see here this area right here between these highways um, is where Smeltertown was. Um, and so you can see how, how the city of El Paso and Juarez have, have grown up all around it. But this kind of brownish area right in the middle is where Smeltertown would have been. Again, right here for those folks who are joining us on Zoom. Um, let me take you back in time a little bit, though. Uh, 
This is an aerial photograph of Smeltertown in the area when it was in its heyday. So this was taken sometime around the 1930s. Um, and here again, you can see all of the features that were part of the physical landscape of Smeltertown. The plant, the copper smelter that was uh, owned by Asarco that was up on a bluff that overlooked uh, the, the Rio Grande, which flows right here. Uh, again, you see the state line. Uh, this is in Texas. This is in New Mexico. So the brick making plant was actually just located across the, the river here in, um, in New Mexico. Uh, the cement plant located over here. Uh, and this whole area down here is, uh, is also part of smelter town. Smelter Town was generally divided into two parts. Uh, there was Upper Smelter Town, or El Alto, and that was located up on the hill. And that part was owned by the company. It was divided into two sections. There was a section known as Smelter Terrace, which is where the managerial staff lived, primarily uh, uh, Anglo managers that, and, and supervisors that lived in that area. And then there was also a Mexican section that the Mexican residents referred to as El Alto. Um, and then all of this down here was known as El Bajo, or Lower Smelter Town. Um, and Lower Smelter Town was um, not owned by the, the company. It was owned, in fact, by the um, uh, other private uh, owners, landowners, and they would rent out property that Mexican families built their homes on. I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, this uh, image right here is of the uh, smelter property. So this is everything that was up on the hill that looked down onto the river and to lower smelter town. Um, you can see here that there are um, uh, the, the buildings that, and the, the smokestacks that are associated with the, the copper smelter operations itself. Um, and there's also a number of other buildings around. Uh, these wood frame buildings consisted of offices. They were also some of the homes of the, uh, the manager. And they were the, um, the buildings of the, the schools, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. Far on the right hand side, you'll see some smaller structures. And that was Mexican smelter town. That was uh, El Alto. Those houses were built by the company. They tended to be made out of uh, cinder block or brick. Um, and they were small two room structures where the, the, the workers lived. This down here is a view of Lower Smelter Town from uh, looking up from the hill. And this photo is from 1911. So you can see how early on this community started to form. Uh, many of these houses were adobe brick structures. They had hard packed dirt floors and thatched roofs. Um, but you can also start to see the beginnings of a commercial district. Uh, the building right down in the front lower right corner of the image um, is, a, um, is a general store. Uh, and you can see the tracks uh, on the front. Um, those tracks take residents from Smeltertown into downtown El Paso, which was about two and a half miles east of, of where Smeltertown was. By 1931, we see here that Smeltertown was a bustling community. Again, you can see the smokestacks and on the hill, um, but the, the lower part of Smeltertown had really grown. Um, you see the, the Mexican-owned commercial district had expanded uh, right there along the county road, which by 1931 was paved and would also take people into, uh, into downtown. Um, in addition to the, uh, the homes that were also still there in, in Lower Smelter Town, there were a number of shops, bakeries, bars. Um, there was a local chapter of the IMCA where residents went to watch movies and to participate in sports like baseball teams. Um, and it, so really it was a very vibrant social world that existed literally under the shadows of the smelter. Now, in the 1970s, Smeltertown met its demise when public health officials discovered high concentrations of lead in the land, in the homes, and unfortunately, in the bloodstreams of several of the children who lived there. By 1973, Asarco and the city of El Paso displaced the final residents and demolished the remaining structures. Uh, the smelter itself continued operations until 1999 when copper prices uh, worldwide declined um, and it remained in kind of a shuttered state uh, until, uh, until 2013 uh, when um, the last remaining structures of the plant were demolished including the, uh, the smokestack uh, which was um, a 900 fo uh, plus foot smokestack. So over the years, former residents have um, 
still continue to celebrate their ties to Smeltertown um, through a variety of ways. Uh, for many years, and I think they still happen, uh, there were annual Smeltertown reunions that included dances and golf tournaments. Um, Smeltertown has been remembered in literature, so in fiction writing and in poetry, um, as well as in online communities, which give um, the community a, a sort of new life in, uh, in collective memory. In my book, I make a few uh, interrelated arguments. Smeltertown was the heart of the economic and cultural life of the city of El Paso and the, the surrounding region. Um, it came into being and it also faded from existence as a result of some pretty big historical changes. So it emerged at the rise of uh, industrial capitalism that spread across the continent in the 19th century. Uh, when El Paso became an international mining and railroad hub. It grew in a place that became uh, the largest border crossing in North America, and it saw one of the largest waves of migration in the 20th century. By the 1970s, it experienced the decline of manufacturing, so we hear about deindustrialization in other parts of the country, and, and Smeltertown also saw this happening um, as well. It also witnessed the effects of nearly 100 years of industrial production and the rise of the modern environmental movement. So Smeltertown's history touches on some pretty big themes and ideas in American history. And it has, I think, really important things to, to show us and teach us about how those forces shaped everyday lives and people. But Smeltertown wasn't just one place that was defined by ge geography or proximity to the smelter or even its relationship as a company town to the smelter. It was a place that was composed of multiple social worlds. So instead of offering a top-down view that privileged the perspective of the company, I focus on the view from the people who live there. Um, Asarco made a company town. And it made a company town to serve its needs for a large, low-paid uh, labor supply. But the workers and the families um, navigated through that world, and they also carved out their own spaces and created their own worlds uh, at work, in the neighborhoods, in the schools, and through their churches. And so their daily interactions in these spaces, sometimes harmonious and sometimes not so harmonious, Help them to define what Smeltertown meant to them. And it helped them to craft a sense of self that was rooted in the places that they encountered and that they uh, lived in every day. And so this is the making part of my book title, how, how people made Smeltertown uh, to suit their, their needs. Memory also plays an important role in understanding what Smeltertown meant to the people who live there. Um, and a lot of what we know about Smeltertown is rooted in memory because it's a place that doesn't exist anymore, at least not in a physical sense. So Smeltertown's history has a lot to teach us not only about what we remember, but how and why we remember. In the end, I tried to make the case that when former residents remember Smeltertown, it's a way of them writing their own history onto a landscape that in some ways betrays their existence. Um, again, what's there, there's nothing there now. It's just a, a, a blank uh, landscape. So um, you know, how do, when they remember, do they tell this, the story of this place and how do they make it um, something that is meaningful to them? Um, it also writes their history into a narrative that fixes Smeltertown into a specific version of the past. Most often, that version is the one from the 1970s, uh, when it was um, a site of lead contamination. In that version, when we only focus on that version, um, it seems as though there was very little about Smeltertown worth remembering. But the former residents uh, that I interviewed for my research had a very different story to tell. When the people I interviewed talked about their positive memories of place, um, it was in part nostalgia for a bygone era, right? So thinking about the good old days. But it's also very much about telling a history that they lived on their terms. Their memories offer um, insight into um, the hardships that they encountered, the challenges that they lived through, but also tell stories about survival and persistence and joy and beauty.
These memories allow us to understand Smeltertown in all of its rich complexity. Now, writing the history of Smeltertown that I wanted to write was very challenging, and it was challenging for a few important reasons. Um, I mean, how do you write the history of a place that doesn't exist anymore? Um, you know, it was very difficult. There was no one archive or one single place where I could go to to find information about Smeltertown. Um, again, it was demolished in 1973. I started my research in 1994, 1995. Um, so there, there really wasn't much that I could find, and so I, I had to kind of scour all kinds of sources to see what I could come up with. Um, if I could find information about Smeltertown or about Asarco, it was really limited, and it focused primarily on the company history. So it didn't really tell us a lot about the history of the workers, um, and it really didn't tell us anything about the Mexican community. Um, I was very excited when I came across a master's thesis in the Special Collections Archives at UTEP when I was doing my work. And um, it was written in 1950, and it was a, a history of Asarco in El Paso and of the smelter community. It had a whole chapter that presumably was dedicated to the smelter community. And when I read it, um, not once did it mention any of the Mexican people who lived there. It was focused primarily on uh, the managerial staff in that, that housing located over in Smelter Terrace, which was important to my story, but it wasn't the story that I was hoping to be able to find. So like other historians, I went through the fragments. I used newspapers, um, archival collections that I could find here and there. Um, I looked through school reports, educational reports, uh, census records, we mentioned the census. Uh, census records were really helpful. Um, I found some church newsletters, and eventually I was given access to company employee records. But on, even in thinking about that, they were really helpful, but they were often material um, materials that were about a community and not of or from the community. So they told me a story and I had to kind of uh, filter through them and read against the grain. So finding the sources from the perspective of people who are not uh, usually included in history was, was one of the biggest challenges that I encountered. Uh, the history and story of workers, immigrant communities, and women. Um, these are often stories that are, are not always a part of the archival record. Um, so I had to, you know, kind of find creative and new ways to get at this history. And I realized that in my research, I was going to really have to rely a lot on oral history, so the narratives of people who lived in a particular place and time and could tell me their firsthand experiences, um, as well as family collections. Um, and, and these are also very much intertwined. Um, as I would uh, set up interviews with people to go talk to them about their stories, often they would bring out things from their personal collections, you know, papers and photographs, photographs that were amazing, um, and other items. And so these family archives became essential for me to tell the story from the point of view of former residents. My journey into researching and writing about Smeltertown, though, if I'm being, um, you know, really candid, began in the memories and in family archives. And so I want to shift now to tell you a little bit about my grandmother's story and to devote the remainder of my comments here this morning um, to talk about how I wove together some somewhat in unconventional sources uh, to tell her history and um, to also offer insight into the history of Mexican smelter town. Um, specifically, I'll talk about three kinds of sources, and in my comments, you'll see how they kind of weave together. Uh, so I will talk about my grandmother's photographs, uh, oral histories with people who knew her and other people that, um, that had lived in Smeltertown, um, as well as uh, some of her papers, in particular, um, this amazing and fragile uh, composition notebook, uh, which included some recipes. I hope that by sharing her story, I can shed some light on how it's possible to use our family's archives to understand bigger historical narratives. So, um, you know, I, I really only knew my grandmother through her photographs. Um, and she had a number of, of pictures, and I remember as a kid, I was just captivated by these old-fashioned photographs. Um, you know, during the holidays, uh, my cousins would be running around the house or playing outside, and I would sit down on the couch and go through these old photo albums and these boxes and boxes of pictures. Um, and there were tons of them. 
um, there were um, these kind of wonderful artifacts, these, these cracking sepia-toned images uh, from a bygone era, and I loved everything about them. I loved the hairstyles that the women had in the 20s and 30s, uh, the old Model T cars, um, and there were numerous pictures of my grandmother, uh, not the elderly woman that I knew who was bedridden and had Parkinson's disease, um, but the young, vibrant woman that she once was. Uh, there were pictures like this one of her as a beauty queen, uh, complete with her fancy crown. Uh, there was another one of her, uh, a styled photograph uh, with uh, a stylish coat and her hair was carefully uh, styled. Um, and I thought she looked like a movie star in this picture. There were images like this one, these tiny little snapshots, and this one was dedicated on the front uh, from me to you. And here's my grandmother standing in front of the, the, the backdrop of this big copper smelter. Um, the back of the image was dedicated to my grandfather. It said, Lorenzo, keep this as a token of, the, of love from the one who really cares, yours, Luce. Uh, and you can see that, um, yeah, she, you know, here's a young woman that, that I would never have, have known otherwise except through these pictures. There was the studio portrait from her wedding, um, and I knew that she was uh, wearing a dress uh, that she had patterned and sewn with her own hands, um, and she was posed lovingly with her new husband. There were many other photographs of my grandmother and of the, um, the women that she knew, uh, and women that I knew, her friends, my great aunts, uh, the ladies from the neighborhood. Now, here these women stood, uh, without the gray hair and the wrinkles earned over a life of hard work and struggle. These pictures captured a glimpse of the past, and I was spellbound by all of the secrets that were held within them. I returned to these pictures many years later. I was a graduate student working on my master's degree at UTEP, and I, I thought, you know, the, these pictures, um, you know, could be an interesting source. My grandmother by that time had been gone for more than a decade, and my grandfather had also recently passed away, and so we were, uh, as a family, kind of sorting through the materials and, and everything in the house, um, and I knew I wanted these pictures uh, because they meant so much to me, um, but, you know, as a, a young and budding um, historian, I knew they could be so much more. You know, and I, as I started to study Smelter Town, I recognized that these were more than just family mementos, that in fact they were historical artifacts that provided a visual representation of Smelter Town. They were fragments of evidence that I had to learn how to uh, analyze with a historian's eye to piece together a much bigger history of uh, community, of immigration and labor, and the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, my grandmother was just one of many people who called Smeltertown home in the early 20th century, but I really believe that her story could reveal much about how Mexican residents of Smeltertown created a sense of identity and community that sustained them in the face of the many challenges that they encountered in the shadows of those smokestacks. Now, the details of her life are unique to her experience, but they also mirrored the experiences of the many people who migrated to El Paso in the early 1900s. So let me tell you a little bit about her story. Maria de la Luz Luján was nine years old when she arrived in Smeltertown. She was born in Parral, Chihuahua, Mexico on November 21st, 1907. In 1917, early that year, uh, she boarded a train from Allende, Chihuahua uh, that was headed north with her parents and her younger siblings, three brothers, Jose, Angel, and Francisco, and their baby sister, Paz. Their destination was Ciudad Juarez and eventually El Paso, where her father had secured a job at the smelter. For the Luján family, the move was rooted in economic necessity and the desire to escape the uncertainty caused by the Mexican Revolution, uh, which, which really swept through the country between 1910 and 1920. In order to fill in the details of her life, um, I wasn't able to ask her about her story, so I turned to oral histories with the people who knew her best. And so it was her brothers, Angel and Jose, who told me about the family's journey to El Paso in 1917. They told me about how they remembered that life in uh, Mexico had become increasingly unsafe, 
And uh, I interviewed them almost 80 years later, and they recalled with vivid detail uh, their, their trip and their journey. Uh, my uncle, my great uncle Jose, uh, recalled the danger and the fear that they lived in. How at times the revolutionary fighting came so close to the family's home that the, form, the family was forced to scramble and hide in nearby ditches. He also very vividly recalled how when the family crossed into the United States on February 22nd, 1917, the entire family, except for the baby sister, Bas, uh, was ushered into the immigration inspection offices um, to bathe and have their bodies, clothing, and possessions disinfected. The smell of the chemicals burned, them, burned itself into their memories. Uh, my grandmother, Luce, would tell her, her children she remembered the smell of kerosene. Uh, later, um, uh, you know, they, they kind of would, would share these stories, and this became a part of the family's uh, collective history. And I think that these family stories about migration offer an important glimpse into a much bigger history. Um, they tell us about the, the lived experience of people as they experienced medical inspection procedures. Um, and these procedures, including quarantines and fumigation of baggage and um, individuals, had begun in El Paso um, in response to a typhus outbreak that happened in 1915 in Mexico. And so there was a public health uh, fear about uh, Mexicans entering into the United States. So these, and, and also it's interesting to note that these invasive and humiliating procedures remained in place at the U.S.-Mexico border for an additional two decades. The world that my grandmother entered into upon crossing the border was very much shaped by segregation. After a short stay in a small apartment downtown, the family settled into a company-owned apartment um, in the segregated Mexican section of Smeltertown. So as you recall, I described earlier, uh, Upper Smelter Town was divided into two sections. Um, the Anglo Company superintendents and officials at that time lived in a part of the, 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 uh, the community called Smelter Terrace. And the differences were quite striking. Here's a picture of uh, Frankie. He was now going by Frankie, not Francisco. Um, but you can see the, the, um, the row housing where the Mexican families lived, uh, constructed of brick. These were uh, really two small, uh, two small rooms um, that, that the families lived in. Um, and it stood in real stark contrast to the, uh, the housing in Smelter Terrace. Um, here in Upper Smelter Town, El Alto, there were no paved streets um, and no electricity or plumbing. Um, and in, by contrast, in Smelter Terrace, the houses were wood frame homes, uh, single family homes. They had running water, electrical wiring, telephone lines, and graded streets. But still, Mexican workers and their families made their homes livable. They planted small gardens, they hung curtains in their windows, and they found ways to make do with limited resources. Here's another wonderful image from my grandmother's uh, snapshots of a merry-go-round that was constructed. You can see it here amidst the company housing where the, um, the Mexican workers lived. So a nice way for, for children to, to enjoy and um, have a place to play. A new life in Smelter Town did require getting, some getting used to, um, but they, people that lived there were also surrounded by things that were very familiar. Neighbors shared similar experiences of migration. Many even came from the same small towns and communities in Mexico. Luz and her siblings attended the Escuela del Padre, or the parochial school, where they learned a new language and new symbols of national identification. Um, here my grandmother Luz stands with her class. Uh, she's on the far um, right as you all are looking at the image. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is here they're holding an American flag, and I counted there's 48 stars on the flag. Um, I can't say for sure what she learned about her new country or what it meant to her, but this picture provides us some really interesting clues about the times in which she lived. And while these pictures, to me, were a valuable source, I often had to confront the fact that they didn't always give me a complete story. More often than not, they raised more questions that I had to continue to seek out answers for uh, in other sources. Uh, soon after arrival, the family welcomed two new members of the family, brothers Manuel and David, um, which was kind of a, a reflection of the shifting demographics that were happening in Smeltertown, with more and more um, you know, children being born in the United States. 
And in these changing communities and families, Mexican-born children, like my grandmother and her siblings, began to see themselves in different ways. As they came of age, they participated in American pastimes. They watched the latest American movies at the local YMCA and engaged in American consumer culture. Most important, they moved into the American public school system where they learned very specific lessons about what it meant to be American. Now, just as a reminder, like many other aspects of life in early 20th century, uh, in the early 20th century, schools in El Paso were segregated, um, and so, so schools were also segregated in Smeltertown. During this time, Americanization programs emerged uh, out of the progressive era reform movement's effort to, um, to bring general reform to, uh, to communities. Um, in cities like New York and Chicago, for example, the focus was on Southern and Eastern European immigrants and attempts to make them more um, quote-unquote American um, in their behavior, in their culture, um, and in language. In the Southwest, the concern was about Mexican immigrants. Americanization in the school system generally meant that schools devalued Mexican uh, children's background, their language, and customs. The idea at these schools was to make Mexican children into good American workers. But within the schools, Smeltertown's youth began to negotiate their cultural Mexican identity with, within an American setting. And the schools became one of the many places where residents crafted their own sense of community. Uh, the Escuela del Padre that I spoke about and that I just mentioned uh, was one place where students like my grandmother and her friends were first introduced to these Americanization efforts. Um, but another one, and one that I think was really important um, in Smeltertown's history, was the Smelter Vocational School. Uh, the Vocational School was founded in 1923. It was supported and, and uh, created by the County of El Paso and the company. In fact, Sarco donated uh, physical buildings um, on plant property for the, the purpose of the school. And it was initially designed for young men and boys uh, to learn industrial traits. So uh, they would, uh, the idea here was that they were training uh, young men who would eventually work in the smelter um, in things like carpentry and machine shop. Uh, students would spend half of their day in training um, in electrical, machine, carpentry, and auto repair shops. And then the other half of the day was devoted to courses in U.S. history and geography, civics, English, and math. Um, in the following year, so in 1924, a girls' school opened. Um, and in a, it, it was very similar, right? Uh, so they would spend half of their day in the language and civics classes, um, but then women would spend the other half of their day learning uh, trades and skills like sewing, cooking, and modern childcare techniques. In both cases, the school sought to impart lessons that would make good workers, and in most cases, these workers would fill low-paying um, laboring uh, ranks. Um, this is one of the images that I found most intriguing um, in, in my uh, exploration of these photographs. It's a photograph from, it appears to be 1929, um, and uh, the numbers can sometimes be a little difficult to read, uh, with my grandmother and her friend Carmen Martinez. And the thing that struck me about the efforts of the vocational school, um, this really underscored that because here you see them wearing two um, outfits which appear to be maid outfits or, or some kind of uh, formal servant. Um, you know, it was interesting. I shared this photograph with uh, Carmen uh, Martinez, Carmen Escandon. She had married and, um, you know, lived next door to my grandmother uh, for many, many years. And so when I interviewed her, I took this picture and I asked her, um, what was up with these outfits? Why, why were you wearing these, these uh, dresses? And, and, you know, she said she couldn't remember why they wore them. Um, you know, it could have been that potentially they were, they were uh, an assignment, so they had to learn how to sew these in their classes. Um, I talked with other members of the family, and nobody seemed to remember my grandmother ever talking about having worked as a domestic uh, or a, a waitress or a servant. Um, so this, this was really one of those kinds of interesting images uh, that I think tells us something about the context uh, of what they were learning in that school, um, but it also doesn't answer all of the questions. Um, and if I may, I want to pause here um, and, and talk a little bit about 
how I looked at those photographs. You know, as I mentioned, there were there were photo albums, there were shoe boxes filled with with pictures. Um, so as a historian, um, I knew I had to kind of understand how they were put together and how they were organized and what I could what I could learn from them and what I might not be able to learn from them. Um, and so I, I think there's three kind of ways that I looked at the pictures and interpreted them. Um, first, I thought about uh, sort of the storage and organization, right? So the photographs in the photo albums seemed to follow um, a, a logic that my grandmother had in putting them together. And so I wanted to be attentive to that logic, right? What was she trying to tell me by putting these pictures in this order? Uh, the photos in the shoe boxes, however, uh, you know, had no order. They were, they were complete chaos, you know, just different time periods. Uh, there were formal pictures, informal pictures, and snapshots. Um, so, you know, trying to make sense of how they were organized and, and what clues could be derived from there. I also thought about the condition of the photographs. Um, and here I'm thinking in particular about the notations that were made. So many of the photographs had notations with dates. Some of them had the names of individuals. This picture here fortunately has both. Um, and, and one thing that I want to point out is sometimes they were different notations, right? So you'll see the date at the top looks like it was written in fountain pen. But the names that are down at the bottom are written in ballpoint pen. And I remember talking with a professor of mine and at the time, and she encouraged me to think about how uh, technologies changed, right? So that maybe the fountain pen was a, an older notation, right? That, that the, she had written this down um, at an earlier time um, and that the names came later. And so I wondered about, you know, how do we kind of um, understand pictures, how, wh how is she communicating, what is, she, what is the purpose of those notations, um, you know, and to, you know, maybe years later going back and adding the names and what her process, her thought process was there. Um, and then I think finally the most important thing was the category. So I could think about sort of the groupings of pictures, right? There were, um, you know, pictures that were kind of focused around uh, specific events that you could kind of take and compare the images one against one another. Um, and then there were also just the locations. Um, and so, so many of the pictures that I found, I could connect back to the vocational school. And I think by, by considering the, um, the, the ways in which the content um, can tell us, again, about what was important to her, it seemed to suggest to me that the vocational school was an important place for her because she took so many pictures of it. Um, it was either the literal background, so the buildings of the, the school um, and, and children or young people standing in front and outside of the buildings of the school, um, or it was the context. Right? So I could compare the pictures and see familiar individuals, right? So this wasn't necessarily outside the vocational school, but a number of the people that were in it were connections and people that she knew from the vocational school. There were images like this one from years later, a Smelter Vocational School reunion. Uh, so you see uh, many of the same individuals, a little bit older, uh, with their children, as you can see posed in the front. My dad is one of the twins uh, kind of kneeling in the front row there. Um, and, you know, sort of how um, this was really something that, that kind of marked their, their lives. Here they're, they're photographed with the, um, the, the director of the vocational school. For my grandmother and, uh, and her friends, it was a place that they forged lifelong friendships and where they acquired the tools that would help them serve the needs of their community. And again, I think this is an interesting way that the family stories and photographs intersect uh, with, with the history. Now, I had read a lot about the vocational school um, and reports by administrators who often had negative stereotypes about the students. But that was not the story that these photographs seemed to be telling me. What did the school mean to the students themselves? The sheer volume, again, suggested to me that this was a, an important place for my grandmother in her young life. It was a place that, seemed that, that she seemed to love and that she wanted to remember. Uh, the way that she and her friends posed for the camera, you know, uh, outside of the school, here they're, uh, you know, a, a class of, of young women together, uh, smiling and laughing. Sometimes they were serious. Um, let's see. Again, smelter vocational school. <laughs> 
um, you know, it, it, it um, really told me a lot about the, the context, right, and suggested to me that the school held an important place in their lives, and it wasn't just the place of assimilation that the reports might suggest. The school was also a social place where young women pushed the boundaries of gender expectations of their parents' generation, especially of courtship and chaperonage. Although the young men and women attended schools in, attended classes in separate buildings, students gathered before and after classes um, and at also at school-sponsored picnics or sporting events um, and other social outings. And it was probably in these unsupervised moments that my grandmother, Luz, first spoke to uh, the young Lorenzo Perales, the young man who excelled in carpentry at the boys' school and whom she would eventually marry. Um, and actually an oral history with a former student and somebody who knew my grandparents pretty much confirmed that that was the case. Um, this was an important lesson for me as a historian. If we only look at certain sources like school reports, we only get one side of the story. We have to be willing to look in other places and to find hidden voices and untold stories. Again, sort of talking about my, my grandmother's teaching opportunities, um, for Luce, um, you know, she, uh, again, was a quick study. She really enjoyed sewing and needle crafts, and she excelled in them. Um, and so her friend Gottman told me that uh, she and my grandmother would volunteer to teach additional classes in sewing and other skills uh, in evening classes to the women of the neighborhood who weren't necessarily students in the classes. Um, and through interviews and uh, different ephemera that I found in my grandmother's collection, um, including certificates, report cards, um, the composition book that I'll talk about in just a moment um, with lesson plans, I was able to piece together a somewhat sketchy timeline of my grandmother's education and her career. By 1934, she re received her vocational teacher's temporary certificate, which allowed her to teach classes in dressmaking, sewing, household service, and domestic science at the grammar school. I don't know how long she taught at the school, uh, but um, education and teaching really remained an important part of her life, uh, you know, really, you know, until um, she, she became ill. Even after her marriage and moving away from Smeltertown, she continued to teach sewing, knitting, and crocheting classes in her home for, uh, for neighborhood women. These classes were more than just instruction in a craft. They also provided an important space where women celebrated friendship and community ties. Her friend Carmen told me in an interview, she said, that's where we got together, see? And the women would get together to pass the time to teach the ones who didn't know how to sew. In another interview with my, uh, with my dad, um, he recalled that the purpose of teaching these classes wasn't necessarily for my grandmother to make money. In fact, uh, he said that the only admission that my grandmother charged was for someone to bring the Kool-Aid and for somebody else to bring the cookies. Uh, another interview uh, that I conducted uh, with a former resident um, told me that it just looked like a get-together, that the women just had fun together. And so by piecing together these fragments, I was fortunate to be able to tease out a hidden history, uh, to look for patterns in the interviews and, and in the photographs, and to put together a portrait of her life and of Smeltertown's women, even if it was sometimes incomplete. Uh, these spaces that women created at the school and in the informal classes in my grandmother's living room uh, also became a place of community action. A number of the vocational school graduates, like my grandmother, became involved in service activities throughout Smeltertown, particularly around issues related to, to children. In this way, they took the lessons that they received at the vocational school and turned them in their favor. Some women coordinated with the company to distribute milk to residents, uh, while others maintained the lists of children that needed uh, school lunches. Other women were involved with issues um, related to health care and their families and worked with the health department nurse that was assigned to Smeltertown to make sure that children received adequate health care and their immunizations. Uh, many of uh, the, the women also took an interest in the local parent teachers association, the PTA, and this in fact provided um, an outlet for my grandmother's creative and artistic interests. 
my grandmother wrote and produced a number of skits and plays that were performed uh, for local parents in their PTA meetings, um, and they involved children and, uh, and families in the neighborhood, uh, and they were bilingual. They were in English and Spanish, um, and so in many ways they were um, intended to encourage membership of Mexican parents. Um, not all of these activities, unfortunately, were depicted in my grandmother's photographs, uh, but many of the relationships and the connections to, to the other women were. Um, and this is where, again, oral histories and images connect. So this is a photo, for example, of my grandmother and several of her friends, uh, the ladies from the vocational school, pictured with one of their former teachers, and this was taken in 1942. Um, and so images like this allowed me to go into oral history interviews and to ask people, um, you know, sort of who are these individuals? You know, what, uh, what you know, did, you know, do you remember about this picture? And it would invariably open up these, these amazing stories about, um, you know, who, uh, who these people were, how they were connected, um, and, and things that were not necessarily depicted in the image, um, but that were by seeing, again, this, this collection together. Um, I want to now turn to one of the other treasures that I found among my grandmother's papers, um, and it was this composition book. Um, it's, it's very fragile, um, you, know, it, uh, you know, the pages are sort of falling apart and the cover is, is bent, um, but within it, it contained so many interesting p bits of evidence and stories that helped me to understand the history of my grandmother and the, the history of Smeltertown's women um, in fuller context. Um, this notebook contained a mix of recipes and what appeared to be assignments from this vocational school, as well as poetry and prose. I think some of the beginnings of one of the skits was in there, um, as well as her teaching notes. The very first page, um, which you can see here, is uh, dated 1928-1929, which would have coincided with her time there at the vocational school. Um, and it's labeled across the top, cooking. Um, the, the page itself contains um, conversion charts, uh, you know, for, for different measurements, for uh, recipes, and the bottom half of the page uh, lists various um, uh, sort of nutritional information and information about calories and, and, uh, and caloric intake. Uh, it noted that, I, I believe it said something like 2,400 calories recommended uh, per day. Um, the cooking and recipe pages uh, that followed contained a wealth of information um, to examine and understand the kinds of lessons that the young women received at the Smelter Vocational School. And I think in some ways it teaches us about uh, the scientific approach that progressive era reformers and educators uh, applied to the household, right? So all of the recipes contained very specific measurements, um, and this was something that was really important, especially if you consider that these are not familiar recipes. Uh, none of the recipes in this notebook are for what you might call Mexican dishes. Um, and so, you know, again, this, this I think really suggests to us um, what kind of information was she taking in as a student at the vocational school? I was also struck, um, and it's a little hard to see here, although you can kind of catch the, uh, you know, sort of the general impression. The handwriting um, is in ink, and it's very precise. Um, so this made me wonder, was this a notebook that she would take notes in and that was somehow graded or would be seen by her teachers? Or was she really embracing these lessons and, and making them her own? The recipes that followed, um, and there were about 40 some odd numbered recipes, um, were for dishes, again, they were not really considered Mexican recipes. Um, this sample page here includes a recipe for uh, baked potatoes and also for a mayonnaise salad dressing. Um, and the other recipe, recipes included recipes for divinity, for um, cakes and pies and, and other kinds of salads. And some of them were kind of those weird salads that you would read about in the 1920s that don't sound terribly appetizing. But I think what's key here um, is that, you know, by documenting these recipes, um, you know, we see that she's documenting things that are not familiar, right? You don't write down recipes for things that you know how to cook by heart or the kind of, of cooking that is taught within the home with a pinch of this, a pinch of that, right? So here, uh, you know, you kind of get a different view of, of what she might have been learning and the, the need to have all of these very detailed instructions. Um, interestingly, as I looked through some of these recipes, they were, you know, pretty standard um, 
ingredients, although a couple of them did include chile, which I thought was really fascinating. And it kind of raised the question for me, was um, this something that was happening in the classroom? Was it uh, the teachers that were trying to make these recipes palatable to the students? Or was it the students that were adding their own kind of uh, flavor um, and uh, uh, interesting ingredients, ingredients that they liked to the, the recipes? Um, so really, we, we begin to see some adaptation and accommodation that's happening um, uh, in the classroom, on these pages, and maybe even at the table. Um, oral histories that I conducted uh, very much revealed adaptation was happening at the dinner table. Um, I interviewed um, all of her, her sons at the, uh, who were alive at the time, um, including um, my father and his twin brother, and um, asked them, did you eat any of these things that were in, in these recipes? And, you know, they, they didn't particularly recall any of those, but they said, you know, at the table, they would often have um, a mix of dishes. So southern fried chicken uh, was a Sunday favorite, uh, but they would also eat tortillas and beans. And so you could begin to see how um, these dishes uh, were, were being incorporated and, and used in, um, on a routine basis. Uh, towards the end of the, uh, the composition book, I found another interesting recipe, which was very different from the early ones. Um, it was a recipe for dulce de arroz y almendras, which as best as I could figure was um, kind of a rice pudding, but uh, some kind of dessert that was made uh, with rice, almonds, and milk, and sugar, um, and cinnamon. Those were the only ingredients. Um, and so it was very distinct from the early recipes because there weren't any specific measurements. Um, it just, and it had very simple uh, directions. It basically um, it just involved soaking the rice, combine with almonds, heat the milk, add the, uh, and then re-add the rice. So um, you would kind of have to know about this dish or have some familiarity with it. Um, was this perhaps a dish that was exchanged among the ladies in her, her sewing classes? Uh, was this something that she jotted down um, after having um, tried it somewhere? Um, and so again, we begin to see um, the difference. There were no measurements, no uh, detailed instructions about cooking for a particular length of time or heating to a particular temperature. Um, and so, you know, below, um, at the bottom, I noticed that there were three notations for um, arroz, almendras, and azúcar, rice, almonds, sugar, uh, with the numbers next to them, uh, 50, 25, and 25. And I wonder, are these prices? Are these the ratios? Um, it wasn't entirely clear. But, uh, but again, I think we see how the content can span um, the different aspects of her life, the formal education that she was receiving at the Smelter, town, at the Smelter Vocational School, and also um, the things that she was experiencing in her, in her life. Um, and I think this notebook was so fascinating to me because in it, we see the complex lessons that were offered within the vocational school, and we can also sketch out the contours of her educational journey that not only my grandmother took, uh, but also other Mexican students took in the early 20th century. And together, they offer a glimpse into her life as an assistant teacher um, and also her social network and, um, and the, the life that she led in Smeltertown. Um, the school was clearly an important place for my grandmother, and it was um, one you know, that, that was depicted very much in her, her photographs and in all of the papers and in the stories that people told about her. Um, but there was another image that I want to share with you, a final image here. Um, and this is a photograph of uh, my great aunt, Bas Luhan. She was the baby who crossed the border with the family. In and she's holding her nephew, uh, Luce's son. And this is by far my most favorite family snapshots. Um, and I think it, um, it captures Smelter, the ideas behind Smeltertown and the book I wanted to write so beautifully. Um, it's actually the cover of my book. Um, I was struck by so many things about this image. Um, I mean, just the artistic angles alone that were in this snapshot. You can kind of see the shadows, uh, the, the smokestack, um, you know, just the, the um, you know, Everything about it was so interesting to me, this kind of idea of happiness uh, against a, a kind of a gloomy or industrial setting. Uh, you can obviously the, see the imposing Asarco smokestack from uh, looming behind the company houses. But I think this picture also 
Mexican families managed to create meaningful lives. The arrival of a new family member um, clearly brought joy. Uh, the fact that it's a picture of an aunt holding her new nephew, which is something that, again, comes from the family memory. If somebody just looks at this, you might think that it's a woman holding her child, but, um, but I know that it, it kind of illuminates the complex social relationships, uh, the heart of the community. I think even more importantly, we catch a very brief glimpse of daily life frozen in time. I was really curious, um, of course, not only about the, um, the story of my great aunt, uh, but the lady who's in the background, you can see her hanging clothes on a clothesline. And I wondered, is she a friend? Is she a relative? Um, as a neighbor, did she stop in to offer advice to a new mother um, or maybe supply uh, an extra cup of beans in a pinch? A community, after all, is about the relationships between mothers and fathers, aunts, uncles, children, grandparents, friends, and neighbors. My search for Smeltertown took a number of interesting twists and turns, but it is very much rooted in the stories that I grew up with and in the archives found in old shoeboxes, in photo albums, and buried in drawers. Sitting on the, that couch in my grandmother's living room many years ago, I didn't have the language or the tools to understand the historical processes that shaped my grandmother's life or to fully appreciate the story that these pictures told me about community um, and, a, and its persistence. Along the way, I learned about how Mexican Americans created working community in the shadows of the giant smelter. I came to see how places like the vocational school, which on the one hand represented educational limitations, could also be seen as important sources of community identity. More important, I came to appreciate my grandmother's story and struggle the limits that she encountered, and the dreams that she embraced. I like to think of us connected across time and space through our mutual love of learning. And I also like to think that she's probably um, a little pleased that her photographs ended up inspiring an intellectual journey. Uh, in the process of taking and preserving her pictures, Luce Lujan helped to write her history and the history of a community that is now uh, vanished from the landscape. These images point to the beauty of everyday life and tell the stories of families who have long been silenced and forgotten. As I tell my students, history is made by everyday people and it happens in our families and it's made in everyday moments. We just have to be willing to ask, to look, and to listen. Thank you. Okay, so um, I am happy to take, I don't know if there were any hands here, but there is a question. Um, uh, yes, how about a question from, from here, the room? Yeah, um, I was curious with the schooling in Smeltertown. Um, in the 1930s, even here in Fort Worth, there was an expectation of only third grade level for Mexicans, Mexican Americans. Um, did it seem like, I know you said the vocational school and they're learning other, um, other subjects. Was there a stopping point, or did they actually graduate them from high school or eighth grade? Uh, so that's a really great question. The question is about um, education and, um, you know, as was often the case in Texas and here in Fort Worth, um, the, there was not the expectation of graduation from high school. Um, you know, so often the education was limited to, to third or fourth grade. Was that the case in Smeltertown? Um, in some cases it was. So the vocational school was kind of an alternative to high school, right? So um, children in the, uh, the El Paso public school system would have gone to the public schools, they would have graduated uh, from there and then gone on to the high school. Many of the people who lived in Smeltertown uh, went through about the eighth grade um, in, these, in the county run uh, public schools. Um, and the vocational school was kind of this um, kind of alternative option, right? And so that's where I, when I talk about limitations, it was kind of a, a very different kind of education. It was intended to have people uh, trained to enter the workforce. Um, and so in some ways, Mexican children were funneled in that direction as opposed to going to the high school um, for further education and then, and then going on. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it did operate in that way. Um, although many of the children did, um, you know, kind of get some education and then this was kind of like on top of that, but not necessarily the, not the, necessarily the equal or the equivalent of a high school education. 
I just wonder, because you often find in like growers' records um, or, or uh, publications of, of, of um, a farmer saying, we don't want them to get more education because then they might want more, then they would demand this. I wondered if you found any of that in the Smelter Town record. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I didn't find any direct reference to, um, you know, we want the, the students to go to this school. We don't want them to be overly educated because then they will demand rights and form unions, which obviously the Smelter was very concerned about. Um, but you did um, see, uh, you know, sort of discussion about, you know, sort of children um, in the vocational, or the young people in the vocational school, because they were probably about 12, 13 by the time they entered the vocational school, um, you know, that they were being trained for positions as, you know, uh, machinists, carpenters, but they were often hired as helpers, right? So even though the, the smelter vocational school in some ways held out the promise of earn, uh, learning a skilled trade and going into a skilled position. The employee records that I got access to from ASARCO and that I analyzed found that many of the Mexican workers, when they entered, either entered as, um, entered employment, either entered as a helper or as a laborer. So I think it's a very similar kind of pattern that you find in agricultural communities like you were describing. Um, but, um, you know, again, it was, it was um, often that this was the kind of training and education of which they were capable, right? So it was that language of that they were not capable of doing this. They needed to be trained how to do manual labor or a skilled trade, which wouldn't necessarily get them paid that, you know, skilled person's um, salary. But that's an excellent question. Um, there's a question from Zoom about whether I tried to replicate the recipes. Um, I haven't yet. Um, so my new research is uh, looking at Mexican women's food labor. Um, and I think I'm going to, to try to start looking at the recipes and trying to make them. Um, some of them are for some really wild dishes, though. And if anybody's seen recipes from <laughs> the early 20th century, um, I mean, you get weird combinations of, you know, mayonnaise and pineapple and, um, you know, so it, it can be unusual. And I'm, I'm curious about how those recipes came about. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, some of the recipes sound great. Like there's a fudge cake, uh, which I would be really excited to try. Um, like I mentioned, the, a recipe for divinity and other candy. Um, so that I think could be uh, an, an interesting way to do some research, uh, quite honestly. Uh, let's see. So here's a question from Zoom about the importance of storytelling and what role the researcher takes in it. Um, when working with personal documents and writing uh, about the stories you find, how do you balance your own voice with the voice of the people in the story? That is a great question. So how do you balance um, the storytelling um, and the, the voice of the historian with the voice of the, the person who is the, the narrator, um, it, which we often um, sort of call that relationship in oral history as the narrator? Um, I think we often forget as academics that history is about stories that the, the story is an important piece, right? That's what captures people's attention. That's what draws people in. Um, I think it's critical to ensure that you're not putting words into the mouths of the, the people who are on your page or who have shared their stories with you. Um, but, um, you know, kind of let them tell their stories in their terms. Um, and so often what I would do is kind of a, a practical way is to reconstruct the story from the point of view of the, the, the source, um, you know, to kind of start with that um, and then, you know, kind of add in to kind of help that story move along a little bit. Um, but I, I do agree that it's important to kind of separate yourself. You don't want to, um, you know, kind of put the, the, your present day perspective um, into anybody's mouth and kind of let them tell their story. Um, in the book, um, that becomes, you know, much more important. What I, what I did was, um, you know, when you're, for example, let me go back a little bit. When I was interviewing people about their experience working in the smelter, um, you know, often, for example, they would talk about their experiences that I would recognize in a certain way as perhaps discrimination, but that's not the word that they chose to use and that's not how they um, told the story. And in that case, I let the oral history stand for itself. And I, I make clear that these are the words of the, the speaker. Um, and then 
I kind of step aside as a historian and provide a little bit of context. Um, so that's why I often in my writing have a lot of perhaps, suggests, um, indicates, uh, you know, all of those conditional words that kind of help us to do that. I hope that answers the question. Um, let's see. Oh, and just a, a thank you there about, um, you know, sharing uh, the journey uh, about, uh, you know, how to do this kind of history, um, you know, that, that I, and I encourage, you know, this is a, you know, a, a, a viewer uh, on Zoom um, has uh, tried to, uh, you know, do this with their own family history. And I really encourage that, um, you know, especially among my students. I have assignments in classes where I have them do interviews. I have them do recipe analyses to talk about um, how their families have changed over time. Um, and, well, you know, students don't always really appreciate the assignments, but I, you know, at first they're like, well, I don't know how to do this, or we don't have any of this. You know, and I, I think that um, I was very fortunate that I had this collection of materials to use. And not everybody has this in their homes, um, but I think we can, you know, even start by just asking questions. Um, you know, with the recipe assignment, I have students uh, select a recipe for a, a, a analysis and what it tells them about their family's Texas history. And um, often they, you know, well, him and haw, and I just, I don't have anything. And I say, just sit down and talk to somebody. Just sit down and talk to somebody in the family and ask them about where this recipe came from. Ask them about your story. And then they tell me later, you know, that was really cool. I, they told me all of these things that I didn't know. Um, you know, and, and all of these tools, I think, are, are so much easier for us to use now. You know, when I was doing oral histories, I was going out with a tape recorder, uh, you know, and, and an external mic. And now, with our cell phones, we can, um, you know, record really great interviews and, and oral histories with our families. Um, and again, it's just the willingness to, to look, uh, to listen, um, and to ask good questions. I have a comment and a question. Um, I spent many years working uh, at the museum at Thurber, Texas, which was a coal and brick mining uh, company town. And uh, the similarities in the story that you tell from Smelter Town and from Thurber are so striking, uh, up to and including the location of the managerial houses up on a hill, out of the smoke and the dust of the smelter, uh, and and the worker housing primarily being down below where all of that may settle and when you may not get the breeze that would blow it away. Mm -hmm. um, but there were many other pieces of that story that you told that I thought, wow, that sounds so familiar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then my question is, when you were able to speak to folks who pulled out some of the treasures from their attics, um, did you have any success convincing anyone to share either images or the originals with an archival repository? That was a big challenge. Oh, repeat the question. So the question, um, so there's a great comment from uh, Dr. Schooley about the similarities to uh, the coal community of uh, Thurber, Texas, which is, is um, you know, again, this is very much the, the history of these company towns, right, with the separation of the managers from the workers, um, you know, uh, in, in space. Uh, so the question was, um, when I interviewed individuals, um, did I have any success, and folks who shared things with me, materials, did I have any success getting them to uh, donate those materials or copies of those materials to archival repositories? Um, sadly, the answer is no, but I haven't given up. Um, so one of the, the most interesting discoveries was I had spoken with um, my grandmother's friend, Carmen um, Escandon, after she married, and she um, had these collections of, they were two bound volumes of the Smelter Church newsletter. And it covered probably, gosh, I'm going to get the dates wrong, but I would say probably at 1924 to sometime in the early 30s. And uh, what was important about this was that the church, so the, the church used to be up on the hill, right up against the smelter, which was probably not a really great place for it because that church eventually caught fire in it. <laughs> and, and they rebuilt the church down in lower smelter town. When they demolished everything, uh, a number of the residents there got together and 
managed to, to get items and, and take them out of the church, including these two bound volumes of church newsletters. Um, and they were incredible. They were written from the voice of the parish priest who uh, was a very interesting character. He had very strong opinions, um, but it gave me fascinating insight into the lived experience of, of the, the Catholic uh, community there. Um, and so they were able to, to take these out. They also stay, uh, you know, were able to remove the statuary to another church. Um, but she ended up with these two bound volumes. And her daughter, um, when I was working on my, my dissertation, um, you know, she knew that I had interviewed her mom and, um, you know, had, had found these. And she says, do you think these might be helpful to you? And I was like, yes, they don't exist anywhere else. Like, can I please see them? And again, they're in, in, in really uh, delicate condition. Um, but I was only allowed to use them and then I had to give them back. Um, and so, you know, I think with time, I'm hoping to be able to, you know, find ways to maybe be able to digitize them. And, and there are some really wonderful uh, groups, um, you know, at U of H, the um, Recovering the U.S. Latino Literary Heritage Project has, um, you know, some, some wonderful grant opportunities to be able to digitize newspaper materials and, and they, kind of specialize not only in Spanish language newspapers, um, which they have a tremendous archive of, but also church materials. And so um, I'm hoping to continue to, <laughs> to, to add sort of gentle uh, you know, suggestion to be able to at least scan the, the material so that they can be used by others. Um, you know, but but uh, yeah, unfortunately, you know, and some did, they, they gave me their photographs and so, I scanned them and I um, donated a collection to the UTEP uh, Special Collections um, as well. Um, so, you know, there, there are materials in my research collection that will end up in a, a repository for others to use. But um, Special Collections at UTEP has uh, a group of some of these photographs. Okay, looks like we've got a couple more Zoom questions. Let's see. Um, when did I find out about the teacher standing next to my grandmother at the vocational school? Um, so there were a couple of, of ways. So there were duplicates of these pictures. Um, so, you know, I, I, we had a picture that wasn't dated or identified. Um, and then there was another picture that I can't remember how I came across as somebody shared it with me that had it identified, it had the people identified on the back. Um, and so that was, um, you know, again, sort of comparing the different versions of, of images. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it was Carmen um, Escandon who had pointed out that that's who she was, that she was a former teacher at the vocational school. Uh, but then I also had the fortune, and, and a lot of these women, I, I kind of recognize them, right? So, you know, she's in the picture, there were some other women, um, but it was nice to have that confirmation to see the picture that had them identified. Um, how did I keep all the different materials from the different people I interviewed organized in a usable fashion? Oh, that's a really good question. So it's a bit of organized chaos, um, I think. So what I tried to do with the photographs is the first thing I needed to do was um, preserve them. You know, so a lot of them were in um, not archival quality um, sleeves, um, you know, and obviously the ones in the, the shoe boxes needed to be put into, um, you know, that non-acid, you know, non-plastic, you know, all of these things, right? And so I tried to keep them in order the best that I could. Um, and and I, so I, I purchased um, some albums to be able to put them in there. Um, in terms of the oral histories, you know, this was, again, the olden days when we recorded on cassettes. So um, I organized the, the cassette tapes and I would make copies of the tapes. So I have um, originals and copies, um, some for which I had permission, I donated to the Institute of Oral History at UTEP um, and they've been digitized. Um, others, uh, the, the people didn't give me permission to donate them to a repository, but I still have the tapes. Um, I also created, um, you know, for the students who, are, who might be listening, um, I didn't necessarily do full transcriptions of the interviews. Um, for the purpose of my research, what I did was I created really detailed um, indexes uh, for each of the interviews. And I would listen to them multiple times and pull out, um, you know, sort of large sections. I mean, some of these interviews went like two hours long, so they were two full cassette tapes. Um, but I, um, you, know, you know, prior to, uh, you know, having really good spreadsheets and, and, 
Zotero and all of these wonderful uh, platforms that allow you to organize your materials. Um, you know, I organized it in color-coded uh, files. You know, so I have the tapes um, in boxes uh, in my campus office, which tends to be a little bit better climate controlled. Um, and I have the, um, the indexes slash quasi transcripts kind of color coded, um, you know, so uh, the ones that focus primarily on the smelter are flagged with like blue labels and the ones that are primarily about the church are flagged with a different color label or green labels. Um, so that's kind of how I organize the material, um, you know, sort of a, a, yeah, I think organized chaos is probably the best way. <laughs> Thank you.